1420, something bizarre happened. Two bitter enemies, the kings of England and France, went to pray at Notre Dame together. They were consecrating a treaty that ended almost a century of warfare between their two nations. A treaty that's still kind of shocking because it gave France, all of France, to the English king. But what makes this story even more unlikely is that the guy who pulled it off, King Henry V, wasn't even supposed to be the king of England. Here's how it happened. In The King, there's this scene where the French princess is trying to provoke the victorious Henry. She says, All monarchy is illegitimate. It's a pretty good insult, because Henry truly had no legitimate claim to the English throne. When Henry was born on the Welsh border in 1386 or 87, we don't even know the year, maybe because no one was paying much attention to his birth, he was just Henry of Monmouth, no prince. True, he was descended from King Edward III, but only through Edward's lesser rank third son. The term you sometimes see about this branch of the family is collateral line. Under the traditional rules of succession, which are totally confusing by the way, up to five family members would have had to die before Henry could become king. But his father, Henry Bolingbroke, didn't play by the rules. Bolingbroke disliked his cousin, King Richard II. And when the unpopular Richard banished him and took away all his lands, Henry B used it as an excuse to mount a coup, which actually worked. He forced Richard to hand over the crown and then possibly had him murdered, although maybe not this dramatically. So Henry's dad became the usurper King Henry IV, but that still didn't mean that the now Prince Henry had a sure path to the throne. See, Henry had a um, <clears throat> testy relationship with his father. The king often favored Prince Henry's younger brother Thomas, who got a prestigious military command in France and a marriage to an archbishop's niece. Meanwhile, in just one month in 1411, the king arrested six members of Prince Henry's personal entourage. In 1412, the father-son rivalry got so bad that Prince Henry, who wanted political reform and was sick of waiting for his father to die to get it, marched on London with an intimidating gang of men. He just ended up publicly apologizing to his father, but clearly the prince wanted to make a statement. In fact, scholars still debate the meaning of his outfit that day, which was a blue robe full of eyelet holes, each with a needle hanging from it. It was Gaga-esque. But there's something even more basic that Henry had to overcome in his unlikely ascent to the throne. He had to actually survive long enough. And given how easy it was to die in the 1400s, that's a huge accomplishment. Like any respectable nobleman, Henry grew up on the battlefield. The king knighted him when he was around age 13, and he commanded thousands of men, possibly before even hitting puberty. On me! And it wasn't ceremonial. He seems to have fought a lot, which nearly cost him at the Battle of Shrewsbury in 1403. While Henry was leading a charge, he got shot in the face with an arrow. The arrow had lodged itself in the back of his skull. He kept fighting, by the way. Eventually, a surgeon slash amateur blacksmith named John Bradmore invented this tool to reach inside Henry's face and grab the arrowhead before blood poisoning could set in, which, ouch. So, with all the obstacles posed by succession, family strife, and brutal living conditions, it's pretty astounding that at the age of 26, Henry was crowned King of England. But if you had to guess, how much bigger was France than Henry's kingdom? The answer is that it was about twice as big and in 1400, at least five times as populated. How Henry managed to take over a country much bigger than his own is through his own very real skill and also the very real ineptitude of the French leadership. You sometimes see Henry referred to as a warrior king because in the decade or so he sat on the English throne, he was fighting the French the whole time. Henry's most famous victory over them was at a place called Agincourt in 1415. And one reason it's so famous is because Henry probably should have lost. Sources vary wildly, but the French forces may have numbered up to 20,000. Henry, on the other hand, probably only had about 8,500 men, and they were exhausted from a long march. Some almost certainly had dysentery. But the English army had one advantage. Henry always brought along three longbowmen for every other soldier. For the French, it was probably more like a one-to-one -one ratio. 
which mattered because the longbow was the medieval equivalent of the machine gun. In fact, arrows were so important to the English side that there was a three-feather tax levied on every goose in some English counties. Henry's longbowmen absolutely tore through the French knights at Agincourt. More than that, the battle revealed how Henry did his homework, although in this case, in a violent sort of way. He imported a tactic that the Ottomans had pioneered during the Crusades. Sharpened stakes in front of his archers skewered the French horses as their knights charged in. But it wasn't all bloody battles. Henry also showed an ability to win the favor of the conquered. He rejected his great-grandfather's strategy of chevaucher, which literally translates to horse charge, but is probably more accurately strategic pillaging. That relative restraint allowed Henry to capture and hold Normandy by 1419, getting him ever so close to Paris and the throne. But what were the French doing while this young English upstart was camping outside their cities, flinging projectiles at them? Well, basically, they were either crazy or killing each other. The crown prince, the Dauphin, led a faction called the Armagnacs, who were in perpetual conflict with their rival Burgundians. The culmination of their really, really bloody feud came in 1419 at a peace summit where they were to discuss ways to defeat Henry. There, and they're at a peace summit, remember, one of the Dauphin's lieutenants axed the Duke of Burgundy in the face. As you might imagine, it drove the Burgundians to the English side. Meanwhile, the poor French king, unfortunately but accurately known as Charles the Mad, suffered from a whole host of mental illnesses. At times, he believed he was made of glass, so he would sit motionless under thick blankets for hours to prevent himself from shattering. But even with all the blood and madness going around, the French side somehow managed to act kind of like a bully in a high school movie. The tennis ball incident, where the previous Dauphin, Louis, sends a tennis ball to Henry and taunts him about either being a boy or playing with boys, almost certainly happened in real life in 1414, which makes the eventual comeuppance that much sweeter. In that huge tree I mentioned in the beginning, Charles the Mad effectively disinherited his own son, the Dauphin, in favor of Henry, who was to marry the French princess Catherine. Upon Charles's death, King Henry of England, or his heirs, were next in line to be King of France. But the United Kingdoms of England and France didn't last. Henry died just a few years later, and the son he had with Catherine was too young to hold on in the face of French resistance. We can only speculate on what would have happened had Henry V lived. Still, even though his unlikely reign was short, his accomplishments were big. This sentiment probably isn't that far off. I would say you have proven yourself to be one of England's great kings.